there. So we're in this directory now where th those commands have been run to sort the data into Calibrator and Pulsar subdirectories. And there are enough Pulsar observations here to run MEM, the, the measurement equation modeling. And then once we run MEM and get uh, a total integrated archive, we can demonstrate how METM works uh, without um, the full range of parallactic angle variation. So the, uh, I guess the, we'll start with the ideal feed assumption calibration. And I thought before we jump straight into calibration, we just, it's good to just take a look at the calibrator data. So if we cd to the cal subdirectory, you'll see there's a bunch of cal files here. Um, we can list the name and uh, type. Um, sorry, sorry again. Can you yeah. can you, uh, can you lift the x there? Oh no, okay, because it, it is a little bit cut off. Is okay, one? perfect. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. I don't know if I can make the uh, font any bigger. On this. Uh, no, no, but it's perfect. The font is perfect. It was just that sometimes it got cut from the uh, bottom bar. Uh, it's kind of messing it up, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'm going to exit this window and start a new one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'll keep it up in, up in the top anyhow. But in this cal subdirectory, um, if we, we can query the name and type of these archives. So I'm going to just stick to the ones that were zapped. Um, so you can see there's a bunch of Poln cal observations. They're classified as Poln cal because the, these are the observations of the noise diode. Sorry to interrupt. I think our director's lecture is somewhat different to yours. Why don't you have a mem directory? Yeah, so if you go into the MEM directory. Some of us can be there. Yeah, in the, so when you open, or when you go into the MEM directory, you'll find star.ar, just a whole bunch of yeah. ARs. Yeah, yeah. So if you go back to the email that I sent, there's a, a sequence of commands that you could cut and paste into the extern, and it'll create, it'll put things into this state. <laughs> ah, so it's like after, after getting to the infection. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Make this go away, oh, it's fine. So the first, uh, was it six or seven observations there are just observations of the noise diode. Again, spanning, so each one of these would be a complete integration, like maybe two minutes. Um, we could verify that by asking what is the length of each observation. So the, yeah, it's close to two minutes of observation on the, on the cal. And these would be performed uh, near 0437, so go, maybe going off two degrees to what's ostensibly a cold patch of sky, but I don't know that anyone's ever really verified that. <laughs> uh, there's actually no need to go off the pulsar. It's a, um, this is my own personal opinion. Really the only pulsar that you need to go away from is Vila. Most other pulsars aren't gonna interfere with the, the Cal observation, but the other five are um, flux calibrator observations. So these are 3C218 or Hydra A and the, the off, off source ones are called flux cal off in their type, and the on source ones are called flux cal on. And you'll see there's a difference in names here. Um, that'll cause a little bit of problem later, and I'll show how to fix that problem. Uh, so those are the data files. We can plot them using PSR plot. So if I just want to look at the phase versus frequency plot, um, I'll do an integration in polarization. So this is just like if I'm not sure that the data contain Stokes I, Q, U, and B, they might contain the coherency products like XX, YY, and the real and imaginary parts of X cross Y. This little polarization integration just ensures that I'm looking at the total intensity when I, when I plot this um, grayscale or uh, image of the uh, phase versus frequency intensity. So just plotting to the screen here, you can see what's pretty much a block. So the, the bottom most frequency channels and the upper most frequency channels have been blanked out. Um, their weights have been set to zero as part of that list of commands that I sent in the email. That was just the zap edge command, just says zap some fraction of the band 
at each edge. And this is just to avoid an area where the filters roll off and uh, things, things get wonky. And by wonky, it's particularly wonky in these data. These are CPSR2 data and CPSR2 had a two-bit digitizer. And with two-bit digitizers, you get minimum 12% scattered power. And so the bright, where the, where the cal is bright in the center of the band, that power scatters out to the edges and kind of messes up the signal in the edges of the band. So we just throw it away. So that's why there's these dark bands in the upper and lower parts of the plot. And then pulse phase goes from zero to one. So this is a periodic square wave that's being driven and where it looks like kind of red noise or reddish colored <laughs> white noise um, is uh, just the off pulse system temperature. And then the bright patch here is where the noise diode is on. So, so it is reasonable to, to zap the cal in the sense if we have, um, I mean, you 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 need you need to you need to clean it all in time, I guess. I mean, it's that 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 is a that is a let's say an allowed operation. Yeah. What a, what a, it'll become more apparent actually when we look at the pulsar data, why um, why why I zap the edges, and maybe we'll take a little detour and look at some of the pulsar um, pulsar observations. So if we do the same thing, plot this phase versus frequency for the pulsars. Here you can see 0437. Now higher frequencies appear lower on the y-axis, so the higher frequencies arrive earlier than the lower frequencies. The DM for this pulsar is small, it's 2.46, and we're not looking at a huge band. I think this is around from, from edge to edge is 64 megahertz. Uh, so there's not a lot of dispersive smearing, but if we, uh, and, and again here I've we're looking at the zapped data. If instead we look at the unzapped data, um, you won't see anything particularly crazy here, uh, but when you integrate over many files, and may maybe if I, so if instead of looking at the, all the channels at once in this um, two-dimensional plot, we could look at uh, individual channels, we could loop through them. So I'm switching now from that phase versus frequency image to just plotting a single profile at a time in a, in a one dimensional way. But I'm gonna loop over channels. So the way to do that with PSR plot is just to say minus L to loop. Chan is the name of the variable that you wanna loop over. And saying zero dash just means start from the first one and go to the end. I don't have to specify the number of channels. Uh, so this actually isn't too bad either to look at. In some of these observations, you can see in the edge channels that the pulsed flux actually looks a bit negative, and that's just an artifact of uh, the scattered power correction. So here I'm just hitting enter and looping. You can see the index increasing above the plot, the chan equals 29. So we're just scanning. You can say each one of these is a row in that previous um, two-dimensional image. So you can see the pulse drifting in phase due to dispersion. Now we've jumped to the next, the next file, channel zero. Uh, you can't really see it here. So what I, maybe what I'll do, <laughs> this is the thing that I wanted to demonstrate a bit. Uh, so if we do this instead uh, here, so we'll have a look first. So this is the, these are the data that have not been corrected for scattered power. And what you'll see immediately is this, the, the pulse looks really fat, uh, unphysically fat, and there's this big triangular base on it. Uh, so what we're seeing in this, on these edge, edge channels is power that's been scattered from the middle of the band where the pulsar is brighter just because the response of the receiver is stronger. And that scattered power is coming in at the delay of that, of those other frequencies. So, I'll show you maybe even better way of looking at this. Um, this is kind of very much an aside to the polarization calibration, but it's an issue. It's hard to see in this plot too. Uh, just the non. I forget the options, so I'll just list options. If you want to list the options for a plot, you can do it with the minus uppercase C, and then just say, give me the options for plot given by the shortcut G. 
So there's a way to crop the data to some percentage of the maximum value. So we could then say, let's set the crop to something like 1% and just see if that allows us to see this um, scattered power effect. So now it's saturating uh, in the on pulse region. And this, um, so if I, let's compare that to what we saw before, about the crop. So there, there's the pulse, the on pulse region. So now the, the on pulse region is saturated, it's all white. And what we're seeing is the very low level emission in this part of the plot here. And I, and I guess the thing I want to s show is this bit that's coming or bleeding into the channel edges is just power from the bright on pulse region uh, affecting the off pulse or the, the other channels or scattering across the entire band. In, it's basically uniformly scattered across the band. It's, it's this scattered power that we're avoiding by zapping the edges. <laughs> This takes place in the digitizer. And maybe the, the best way to think of it is with two bit quantization, you have four levels, it's very coarse. The quantization error is large, but the quantization error is, uh, it has, it's, it's spectrally, yeah, it's spectrally flat, let's say. So when the pulse comes in at one part of the band, this, the, the quantization error kind of gets scattered uniformly across the band. So you, you end up creating, uh, if you think of the pulsar uh, sweeping across the band, it's, it becomes imprinted on a shelf of quantization noise that has increased. <laughs> so you get a, re a rectangular floor of quantization noise, and then when you de-disperse it, that rectangular floor makes those triangular bases that we see in the, in the integrated profile. This is a bit of a, an, an aside to the calibration, but just explaining why we, why we zap the edges. Are there any, any other questions at this point about, about scattered power or... So let's have a look at the cal. Uh, we've kind of looped through the channels. One thing we can do, uh, and one thing I like to do early before I get too far into things is to check for... Uh, any signs of over overpolarization in the data? Um, overpolarization can arise from a number of things like we've mentioned before, like when you saturate a digitizer or you drive an amplifier into compression, or in some cases, you know, Stokes I and Q can be treated to dif differently to Stokes U and V using different scale factors in some part of the electronics, the digital electronics. So there's a bunch of ways that things can become non-physical. So one way to check for that is using this program PACV. PACV is not very well documented. In fact, I don't think there's a web page that documents this program. So it's, it, it is, I guess, the, it's the polarization calibrator visualizer, <laughs> if you want to say, what, what is the V? Um, I'll, I'll first just show the help. It has this uh, nifty feature, the minus N feature, which allows you to plot different things in different ways. So you, you have to give it a three character string of which, what, and when. <laughs> and the which, you can plot either the cal signal, so that's the on pulse minus the off pulse, or you give it an S if you want to look at the system temperature, just the off pulse noise. And then uh, what you plot, you can either plot all four Stokes parameters, or you can plot just the total and polarized flux as two separate curves. And then, U is for the uncalibrated raw data. And C, by calibrated here, we apply the calibrator to itself and just see how that, that looks. Um, so the first thing I'll do is show the uncalibrated Stokes parameters. So we're gonna do an N, so we wanna see the cal, the Stokes parameters, and uncalibrated. Uh, and we're in the cal directory, so we'll just say start as a Z. So here you can see, uh, a plot again as a function of frequency, so this is a spectrum. Uh, and on the, on the y-axis, we have plotted in white, the total intensity, in red, Stokes Q, in green, Stokes U, and in blue, Stokes V. And the first thing you see is that nice sinusoidal form in Stokes U and V. 
which we now recognize as differential phase and probably some linear differential phase gradient across the band. So that's um, one thing to note here. The, and we, we can cycle through all of the calibrator observations one by one and see that at least over the day, things didn't change much. You might've seen the Q and, sorry, the Stokes U and V curves shift a little bit to the right at that point. So over the day, things changed a little bit. It, um, to, to look out for overpolarization though, you wanna take this calibrator and plot uh, the total intensity and polarized intensity. We could look at the unpolarized or the uncalibrated data and it just shows us that you can follow by eye the spectrum here. And in some of the channels, you'll see that the red line is above the white line, but you don't get a really good feel for um, what fraction. It's kind of hard to do it by eye. Uh, so to, if you self calibrate, it basically normalizes everything so that the total intensity, it's like bandpass flattening, I guess. So the total intensity of the cal comes out as one, and then you can see how the noise diode compares. So CPC is looking at the cal, plotting IM, IMP, and first performing self-calibration. And that flattens Stokes I. We're still getting error bars on th these things because these are estimates that are being derived uh, from noise. But really, because we've divided by the total intensity, it, it is identically one. And you can see the polarized flux uh, fluctuating here going, uh, you know, looking like a, it's around one, but then on the right-hand side of the spectrum or at the highest frequencies, it's average is maybe around oh, one, one or 1.5% 1 overpolarized. And this is probably a sign that our scattered power correction algorithm was a little too ambitious. So the scattered power is unpolarized. And before performing the scattered power correction, the, polarized, the, the degree of polarization of the cal would always look something like 85 or 87% polarized. And then after scattered power correction, we, we, see, we hope to see a degree of polarization close to one, but we sometimes see it over one. So I, in this case, I would blame our scattered power correction algorithm for uh, introducing something that looks like a nonlinearity in the system. But things were already pretty nonlinear with a two-bit digitizer. So you knew how to, where to look for that, right? But uh, if you don't know, how do these affect the final solutions? How, how would this overpolarization affect? Yeah, like uh, if, for example, I don't know where to push it, and I probably like, mix it some, somehow. Yeah. Uh, how badly it will like, uh, screw up things? It's a, it's a good question. So even when the cal is only 85% polarized before we've computed or done the scattered power correction, you could say that pro probably the phase of U and V is not affected too badly by the scattered power. So you'd still get a good estimate of the differential phase. But if the scattered power, because X is digitized separately to Y, and so they could have different attenuation levels going into their digitizers and different levels of scattered power. So that, that scattered power could, uh, in principle, strongly affect your estimate of the differential gain between the two receptors. Yeah. Um, um, but how do you correct it? I mean, uh, now you were saying that there, there should be an algorithm to correct the, to correct the scattered power. Yes, yeah, that's right. So these data have had that algorithm applied to it. So the dot, the raw dot AR files straight out of the box were scattered power corrected. Um, that was just in some of the processing before producing that data. Um, there, there's an algorithm uh, that can be applied. <laughs> just lost slides. Uh, basically, when when we, you can, you can basically do some uh, mathematics to invert from the average power uh, that's recorded, you can basically backward propagate to understand what, and, and I guess you're also understanding how the data were unpacked uh, by the two-bit unpacker. 
like by unpacking, I mean converting those two bit samples into floating point numbers before you do any computation with them. Uh, so from, from the average flux, you can estimate what, what percentage of that flux would have appeared as scattered power coming out of the digitizer. So you do that by integrating the flux over all the frequency channels and making this estimate um, and then subtracting that from the flux in XX and doing the same thing to the flux in YY. Uh, right now, I don't know of any theory for correcting Stokes U and V or the real and imaginary parts of the cross correlation. Uh, that, that could be an problem. Yeah. But is that a, is that a tool in PS archive to apply this correction? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, which one is it? So it, I think it's accessible only in PSR shell, and uh, you, it's just SPC scattered power correction. <laughs> so if I go into the PSR shell and say help, it should show up. Yeah, here we are. Apply apply scattered power correction. That's really specific to two bit data. Um, or data, oh, okay, I see. I see. Data that were quantized using two bits per sample. Okay, because I really I never heard about this, frankly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So th these okay. data are a bit old. It, okay, it, okay. Thankfully, nobody digitizes with a two bit digitizer anymore. Uh, so maybe everything I've been talking about is a bit outdated, but it, just explaining a, a little bit about the various reasons that you can end up with something like overpolarization uh, in, in your signal. Or in your in your calibrator signal. Um, right. So we we can also look at, um, for example, we we looped through and looked at the um, the waveform in each channel, and we plotted the mean Stokes parameters as a function of frequency. But we can also say, well, what does the solution derived from these calibrator archives look like? So if we piece our plot minus p calm. Column is just cal, cal model, and it can, if it's given a raw observation of the pulsed noise diode, it can compute the ideal feed assumption solution from it on the fly. So we just say start at ZZ and plot those curves again. The absolute gain on the bottom, the differential gain in the middle panel, and the differential phase in the uppermost panel. And that linear trend in differential phase is what was causing Stokes U and V to vary sinusoidally when we plotted them as a function of frequency. <clears throat> so the first step in calibration when we want to apply the ideal feed assumption is to create a, a database. It's not a SQL database or anything, it's just a flat text file called a database. Uh, so if we run uh, pack minus w says write a database, minus u tells it to look for any files with the following extension. So I'm basically saying I'm in a directory full of .zz files and I want to create a database that contains all of them. And when it's done, um, you can see here, it's just created this text file and it, it's just a text file. So it's just a list of the observations that are in it. In this directory, you can see all the pollen cows. It's basically documenting everything here that's needed to create a match between a calibrator observation and its associated uh, pulsar observation. Uh, um, so you want to know the right ascension and declination to know how close was it to the pulsar. You want to know the MJD or, or date of the uh, epoch of the observation. And then we have the bandwidth, the center frequency, number of frequency channels, the instrument that was used and the receiver that was used to, to make these observations. And it lists both the polarization calibrators and the flux calibrators. <coughs> so flux, flux calibration um, is pr pretty straightforward. It's just determining, so once, once we determine the gain that, the gain that was plotted here is really the gain that makes the calibrator, the noise diode have a flux of one. But then we want to determine the actual flux of the noise diode in Jansky's. So we do that by firing the noise diode while looking at a source of known flux. In this case, uh, the source is missing, but three, it's hydra A. 
So FluxCal, you just tell it, there's a program called FluxCal that generates flux calibration solutions. And you can just give it the database and say, go through here and make solutions wherever you can. Uh, so it'll go through there. This is gonna fail. No, oh, it didn't fail. Oh yes, it does fail in the end here. This error unloading solution. It's saying, I don't know who this um, calibrator is. There's no calibrator in my list of known calibrators with that name. Uh, so the quick way around that is just to tell FluxCal to fix the source name. And the way it does that is based on the right ascension and declination. It goes, okay, that's, that's actually this calibrator. Uh, just does a little proximity check. So tell, you tell it to fix and then it's happy. You can see it produced this file at the end here. Uh, but does it does it understand uh, um, in the sense like now now with flux with flux call the, the the aim is to produce is to convert uh, um, the, the 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 fluxes of the calibrators in physical units no the the, the noise diodes um, and uh, I mean now now flux call is is getting all the calibrators that we have in the directory uh, noise diodes and. Uh, um, yeah, so it, and, yeah. it goes through that database and just looks for the observations that have type flux cal off or flux cal on mm. and groups them if they have the same RA and DEC and they happen around the same time, uh, it'll group them into a, a set and say, okay, I'm going to create a solution from this set. And then uh, the solution will be, or, or there will be a new file like this, this flux yeah. cal that can be applied then. So, so, so it's not that we are actually taking because before you said something like we we, we take the we shot the noise diode while looking at a source of known flux, but is I mean this is not of course uh, simultaneous. Uh, or was yeah, it? So the, the flux cal on observations, the telescope mm -hmm. was pointing at Hydra A, and yes, the, and the noise diode was firing. And then ah, okay. flux cal off the telescope is pointing two degrees away or something from away from Hydra. So you can see the declinations here are being changed by approximately two degrees. Ah, fair enough, fair enough. And and uh, but still with the with the noise diode firing or not? Also with the off one. diode firing, yeah. Okay, perfect. I understand. Thanks. And so the noise diode is assumed to have constant flux while pointing on and off, and then. But we also allow the gains, so the attenuator levels are being reset when we point on and off Hydra to keep everything in a linear regime for the digitizer. But even with those gain fluctuations, uh, it's possible to normalize everything out. And what you end up measuring is uh, the, the system temperature and the so, um, absolute flux of the noise diode in uh, Janskys. So that's what these two plots are showing here. In the bottom panel is the absolute flux in Jansky, so the noise diode is about one Jansky, and white and red lines here are the two polarizations. So we we do this calibration procedure separately for XX and YY. And then in the upper plot, you can see the system temperature in Jansky is going from some, something like uh, 19. So this is the system equivalent flux density, going from around 19 Janskys down to say, closer to 15 Janskys. So the noise diode is less than 10% of the total flux going into the system. Um, the equations for how, to, how this computation is done are actually in the tutorial. Uh, if I scroll back up, um, it just shows you a couple of examples where, so on the right, or sorry, on the left you see a flux cal on observation where the noise diode looks really weak and noisy. And on the right, you see a flux cal off observation where the noise diode stands out a little more clearly. Both of those are integrations of the same length. It's just Hydra uh, kind of swamps the noise diode on the left. And then, so the green line and red lines in these curves, I don't know if you can see them clearly. Uh, the green line is the on cal and the red line is the off cal or the on noise diode or off noise diode. So that we get four measurements from these two observations and then those four measurements are combined in certain ways to give you ultimately the system temperature and the uh, flux of the cal 
a CMOT. So these three, uh, these two ratios are computed and then these, these equations are solved for those, those two unknowns. Um, I, I won't dwell on that too much, uh, but th those equations are pretty um, straightforward to derive um, from what, what you measure. So that's, that's flux calibration. Uh, we can now apply the flux calibrator and the noise diode observations to perform uh, the ideal feed assumption calibration and flux calibration at the same time. Uh, so the way, so I guess we already looked at one of these ideal feed assumption solutions. So we'll just go to the Pulsar data now. There's only ways to separate the commands and the plots coming out a little bit, so that when the plots, that they don't always overlap. Yeah. If I put the commands down low yeah, and the plots up high, yeah, then just is that? Just not, yeah. yeah. And are the commands still visible to everyone online as well? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. All right. Thank you. So let's calibrate a pulsar. Uh, here again, we have these observations of 0437. Uh, so maybe we'll, we can just take a quick look at one of them. When we scroll through, um, so now I'm gonna plot the Stokes parameters using the cylindrical coordinates um, and loop again through channels. But I, I'm gonna jump to channels, maybe channel 20, uh, and look, look at just one of the archives. I'll just say star.ar. Um, here you can see uh, the profile for 0437. Uh, the red line is the linearly polarized flux, the blue line is the circularly polarized flux, and the upper uh, curve gives you the position angle. I'm just going to show how the polarization varies with frequency in uncalibrated data, mostly due to the rotation of U into V as um, uh, caused by that differential phase. So if you keep your eye on the, mostly on the V curve, that blue line, uh, you'll see it changes quite a bit, it flattens out, uh, that negative dip is gone, and then it's something positive comes back. Maybe I should shift by, uh, I'll rotate. I think on the Mac I have to do it here. Uh, so I'll rotate by half a turn so it's more, more central. So we start out with negative Stokes V going into positive Stokes V. Very quickly that flattens out and Stokes V becomes positive going negative. Um, it becomes as large as the linear polarization at one point and it flattens out again. So you can see the pulsar is basically uh, to totally uh, corrupted. If we, if we now integrate before, instead of looping over all of the channels, we integrate over all of the frequency channels and just look at the um, total, maybe I'll start with the ZZ so we don't have to worry about edge effects. Uh, you, can, you can see, it actually doesn't look too bad, but the, basically you're seeing depolarization. Uh, the, the, the circular polarization in 0437 should be much higher. So if you integrate over this, um, differential phase effect over all the frequency channels, it's gonna depolarize the signal. Maybe what we'll see here now is as we go as a function of time, the receiver is rotating with respect to the sky. So we're gonna see this change now, or the, the polarization will change now due to that rotation. You'll see um, a trade-off again between Stokes V, because now, why is Stokes V changing as we rotate the receiver? Well, it's because Stokes U is changing and then Stokes U is being rotated into V by the differential phase. So you can see we're getting different kinds of depolarization and variability in those bottom curves, mostly the red and blue curves, are the ones of interest. We're gonna try and make that go away with calibration using the ideal feed assumption. Uh, so we basically can just run PAC uh, minus D. So we want to use a database. PAC is the program that does the calibration and the database is back in that cal directory. This just tells PAC where to look for the uh, calibrator files. And then just start at ZZ. So we want to calibrate the zapped 
uh, archives. Um, things should scroll along fairly quickly. <laughs> I'll leave that to scroll and then I'll talk about what it's doing uh, at the end. But basically it's performing the ideal feed assumption calibration and applying the flux calibrator. So it's reporting where it's getting the, the poem calibrator from, one of those archives, and then it reports on where it got the flux calibrator, which was just constructed from that file that was generated when we ran fluxcal. And the output files have had their extension replaced, so they're no longer .zz, they're .calib. <laughs> Kiara, so um, um, concerning the, so, so, so in this case, um, all the noise diodes are chosen as the closest in time to the reference observation. So if we get an observation, then the, the closest cal is chosen. Yeah, that's a good point. So the, and it, um, so you can see here, the, the, this one here, ends in 14.925 or 01.49.25. We scroll up a bit and we should see um, a different, uh, no, up here, a different calibrator being chosen at different times. That's right. So there were, there were maybe seven or eight of those calibrator observations and they would be done pretty much at hourly intervals over this long track. Mm. Yeah. Uh and, the, and concerning the concerning the flux call, um, so I mean, of course, uh, I, I don't know how long was the were the observations of the hour I don't remember if you said it. Um, but in general, I was wondering what is a safe time distance. Like, for example, if I have a flux call that is got like the the week before, and I do observations a week after, can I still use that flux call? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we, we do um, when we apply these flux calibrators to say parks observations. And I guess it boils down to what, um, how stable is the flux of your noise diode? And that's something that could be tested and I've never done it, but you know, so that one plot where we, sh where we showed the absolute flux of the noise diode in Janskis, you could, you could go over your history of flux cal observations and just see how, how much does that vary with time. And I, I've never done that. All ah, right, because then uh, I mean that 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 would be that would be the um, uh, yeah okay I understand I understand yeah perfect. that would kind of define your cadence for these yeah uh, yeah uh, flux cal okay perfect perfect thanks a lot yeah no problem so one one thing we can do now is say well uh, did did this first over order calibration make the variability go away. So I'm just gonna do the same thing that we looked at before with the uncalibrated data. And, and now again, integrating over frequency. So the differential phase should be fixed and the differential gain sh should be fixed. Um, and I, I think everyone will agree that things look a lot better. Um, there's much less depolarization of Stokes V in this first plot. But again, as we evolve in time, we'll see, we'll see that things still do change. Uh, you can see now the linear polarization being converted into circular. Yeah. Yeah, mostly in that first component we saw it, and I think later we'll see it yeah, rising up again. So this is not intrinsic to the source. This is just a consequence of applying the ideal feed assumption, which doesn't apply well to this multi-beam receiver. Yeah. So that's kind of an indicator that, well, there must be some, either a bug in the software that's doing the calibration or maybe that ideal feed assumption isn't uh, valid and, and there is actually cross coupling in, in the receiver. Yeah. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll just make an integrated total. Uh, I'm gonna PSR add minus. So minus capital T tells it to T scrunch as it goes. So I'm not creating a file here with lots of sub integrations, I just want to create an integrated total. Uh, um, so this is just an integrated total of all the calibrated ar archives. The reason I'm creating this is, uh, e even though it's not perfect, it's still a pretty good um, estimate. So if we plot it now, uh, 
Um, it's not a bad estimate of the polarization of O437. And when we move to MEM uh, to, to do measurement equation modeling, it's nice, it's nice and convenient to tell MEM uh, to choose the phase bins to use uh, as constraints. So MEM is a bit expensive because it's doing this nonlinear least squares, which involves inversion of large uh, Hessian mat matrix. So every phase bin you add as a constraint introduces four new model parameters that have to be fit. So your, your Hessian matrix grows. So typically we just, I just run PCM. I think the default is just to choose 16 phase bins as constraints. And you want to choose the best ones. And the best, the best ones are where the polarized flux is greatest. And you also want to throw into the mix a good range in the variation of the Stokes vector. So um, the nice thing is with 0437, it has this transition between orthogonally polarized modes. So I can, I can choose phase bins from either side of that jump. But you also want um, polarization states that, so orthogonally polarized modes are anti-parallel Stokes vectors. You, you also want a Stokes vector that's perpendicular to that axis. Uh, so uh, PCM, if you tell it to choose phase bins, it'll try and do that intelligently by choosing bright ones and getting some orthogonal ones that are like, say the brightest orthogonal um, phase bin. Right, so that's why we're creating this integrated total. Uh, maybe if I squish this box a bit, you can also continue to see the plots even while I'm typing. Um, Dylan, I'm sorry, I, am I, I might have lost one sentence. Well, so the, I mean, why, so, I mean, PCM always operates a choice in the bins? When, uh, or, or, yeah. yeah. When you're doing M MEM, or yeah. MEM, equation modeling, it has to choose, or it's some, something has to choose what phase bins to use as constraints. And you can do that by hand, or you can just tell it, here's a, here's a nice version of the profile where things aren't completely depolarized. And you can tell it to choose phase bins uh, from that. It's but it cannot use all the phase bins because it would be too computationally expensive? Yeah, it gets, it gets oh, okay. yeah. Like, I, I could demonstrate that maybe. If we went from 16 to 64 phase bins, it would really grind to a halt. At least it used to. Computers are getting better all the time. <laughs> I mean, Thanks. Stuck in my thinking back in 2004 or something. Uh, right. So if, if there aren't any questions about the ideal feed assumption, I'm going to jump into modeling using MEM. So I'll go back. Um, I'm going to show first a, a bad fit um, and then discuss a little bit why it's so bad. So PCM works with the same database and we're telling it where the calibrators are, even though we're going to be modeling mostly the pulsar, having the noise diode observations puts PCM uh, solution into the, the ballpark. Uh, so it, it um, makes the first guess much better. And there are local minima in this chi-squared space where it can get stuck if it doesn't start with a good first guess. So it, it uses the ideal feed assumption to get the differential gain and differential phase as the, or the first guess of those values. Uh, we also, I'm gonna tell it the name of the file to use for choosing pulse phase bins. So that's the one that we just created, this calib.tt, that integrated total. Uh, I'm gonna tell it to use a different model parameterization as well. So this is the Britain 2000 equation 19 parameterization that I showed you in the slides, that big, that long sequence of boosts and rotations. Uh, it's my preferred parameterization, but it's currently not the default of PCM. Uh, I don't really like to change default behavior even when my preferences change. So I would recommend most people to use this model. <laughs> and the things, the pulsar constraints will be the next thing. So this is gonna fly by with a lot of information and maybe, maybe I will make this bigger again just, just to keep that information in sight. Um, when I hit enter, uh, so mostly it's 
telling me about the decisions it's making. It's loading each one of those .zz files. So notice we're not loading the calibrated pulsar observations because we want to model the uncalibrated data. And there's telling me the first 18 channels were flagged as invalid. That's what happened when we did zap edge. And maybe you'll notice right away, these reduced chi-squareds are terrible. We're getting like 39 or 40. And the, the reason for that is the um, pulsars, they, they're very stable, but their flux varies uh, quite dramatically on time scales from seconds to hours. Uh, so P PCM by default doesn't know how to model variations in the gain of the system. So I'm going to um, demonstrate first the, the scintillation that, that's um, present in the Pulsar data. So we're going to add and create a um, all dot p. So on, on the fly, I'm going to uh, integrate in frequency and integrate in polarization. But I'm not going to t-scrunch these data. So we'll, we'll end up with a file. The output file here will have uh, multiple sub-integrations. So we can, when that's done, so we just created this file, all.zfp. Uh, what we'll do now is um, plot this in a phase versus time plot, which is py. You could also say um, p time. Uh, y is just the shortcut for this plot. And we'll um, just have a look at, uh, I better rotate again. So here, here you can see as a function of time, the pulsed flux uh, varying, uh, you know, reaching a, a minimum around five hours in, but having that really bright spot somewhere between three and four hours in. So that variability isn't being modeled, and that's what's causing the reduced chi squared to be so high. So we could say, well, let's try and model the gain variations as a polynomial. Maybe there's one, two, three, four, five peaks in this curve. And if I have a polynomial of the order five, I might be able to uh, model all of that. So the, the way to do that in PCM, uh, if we scroll up a bit, there's this option here to model a parameter as an n degree polynomial, where the parameter can be one of absolute gain, differential gain, differential phase, or all of the above. And I'm not sure where the W comes in here. Forget that. But basically, it's an end, uh, W is describing this bit up here. We'll come back to that later. Uh, the, so I can tell it to if we go back to where I ran PCM, we'd say we'll model the game as a fifth degree polynomial and try that again. Again, we have to load all of the data. One thing that's kind of been on my to-do list for a long time is to short circuit this step and have, because while it's loading the data, it's doing a lot of conditioning. Um, maybe it could output the data that it's conditioned and prepared for the fit in some table, and then I could just load that table each time I want to experiment. But, um, so, but this, sorry. sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I was saying, I mean, this this um, this step of uh, modeling the gain with polynomials, for example, by the way, I think that the, the reduced chi score is still not super good, uh, should be done every time that we have a scintillating parcel? Uh, no. <laughs> so what I was going to show here is, you could try doing it, but it doesn't really help that much. <laughs> uh, and that might be just because the kinks and wiggles Perfect. are too many. And so I, I tried, like, well, what if I go to 10th, 10th order polynomial? And again, we have to wait for the data. But what we'll see here is the fitting procedure just kind of explodes. So for some reason, having too many uh, polynomial parameters produces these singular matrices that don't aren't invertible. I'm not sure why, I haven't investigated why, but um, there's a better solution. And that's basically uh, to normalize each pulse profile by its invariant interval integrated over pulse phase bins. So if you remember, um, Matthew Britton identified that, I, I, said, I said he identified it, but actually it had been identified previously by people like Dan Steinbring, let's say Matthew Britton was the first to suggest using it for pulsar timing. Uh, 
this invariant interval should be invariant to boosts and rotations and scaled only by the gain of the system. And that, by system, that could be the gain of the interstellar medium, the, the scintillation. So if we compute this invariant interval and integrate it over all phase bins, it becomes a good estimator of the varying gain applied to the pulsar. So basically, if you just add the command line option minus s, it says take each observation, compute this integrated invariant interval and uh, in the on pulse region and use that as a normalization factor. And what that does, especially, uh, I'll just run that. Uh, I'm gonna control C for a second, and just see, did it produce this file that I think? So here it's produced two files. It shows, you can plot um, chosen.ps, which unfortunately shows the bins that were chosen are shown with da dashed vertical lines but they're all clustered around the peak, which, which unfortunately is plotted at the edges of the plot here. So you can see, you can just see what were the 16 phase bins selected. Uh, the, the next one here is the on pulse. So it just shows you using the color cyan, I guess. It's putting cyan dots on all the pulse phase bins that were identified as on pulse. And it's that, that region here is the region that's from which it's computing the total invariant interval and using that as a um, normalization factor to, to take out the gain variations in, in the pulsar. I'll go back to running uh, PCM now, loading all the data. So when, when you're loading the data and you start to see things, you, you won't see it here, but if you start to see error messages like, um, so many, some number of points failed out of some number of attempts. Most of the time, that's where the signal to noise ratio has gone quite low. And this invariant interval um, becomes either close to zero or negative uh, and becomes a bad thing uh, to use for normalization. But maybe, maybe the main thing to point out here is the small victory where <laughs> we've gone from a reduced chi squared of close to 40. You know, we got it down to somewhere in the 20s with with a polynomial, but with this normalization, we're tracking quite well and getting a reduced chi squared of you know something reasonable. It's not perfect, but it's much better. So this is what we should aim to. I mean, we should aim to see that the reduced chi square is sort of close to one, and like one obvious one. One of the first things that we should try to make it work is by using this minus s plus. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think it's a that's probably one of the most useful options. Maybe another useful okay. option to speed things up is to run this in a multi-threaded mode. <laughs> so if you put minus T4, it'll use, it'll run four threads and make better use of the cores on my laptop. If you're on a bigger machine, you can run 12 threads in parallel and blitz through the data. Again, we have to load it all again. So I maybe should have balanced the cost. Of <laughs> but now you'll see four solutions pop out around the same time. Well, thanks a lot. So I'll leave this running for a little while. There's only, these, these data have only 128 channels. So this will take maybe a minute or two before it finishes. But while, while it's running, uh, are there any questions about what's happening? <laughs> if, if you remember that slide where I had the, the measurement equation, I had said the observed Stokes parameters are the Mueller matrix times our rotation matrix times the unknown model Stokes parameters. So basically we're modeling the unknown Stokes parameters in 16 phase bins and the unknown Euler matrix that would be derived from an underlying Jones matrix. So we're parameterizing everything in terms of those seven degrees of freedom. But basically, um, but the, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was saying, but it's not choosing. I mean, now, um, because I remember the, the, the thing of the phase bins, so now it is actually running basically on all the bins that it has. Only the 16 chosen phase bins are currently being included in this, in this case. And so when, once it's done all the modeling, it just goes back and applies the model to the data. And then it even calibrates the cows <laughs> using this model. But the, the final result that comes out here is this total, 
well, first there's a PCM.bits, which is the solution, and the total integrated archive um, that, that comes out of the calibration procedure. So we can plot now this using the same command, uh, everything in this PCM.fits file, make this a little more vertical. Uh, so here you'll see now six degrees of freedom being modeled. So starting from the bottom of the absolute gain, one up is the differential gain and the differential phase. The Britain parameterization, instead of modeling directly the ellipticity and orientation of each receptor, its free model parameters are the sums of the ellipticities, which will appear in the upper plot, and the differences in the ellipticities, which are plotted in the uh, bottom plot. Oh, sorry, the differences in the ellipticities and orientations. So the I think the white line is the difference in orientation and the red line is the difference in ellipticity. And then the upper plot is the sum. Now the, sum, the reason we're showing only the sum of the ellipticity in the upper plot is because we had to assume the orientation of receptor zero was e equal to zero. So there's no sense in plotting all zeros in that, in that uppermost plot. And that, that assumption had to be made because otherwise that rotation about the line of sight is unconstrained. And if you remember, there was the other unconstrained parameter, which was the boost along Stokes V, which is given by the difference in the ellipticities. And the reason we were able to constrain that is because we included these flux calibrator observations amongst the constraints. <laughs> The, the delta chi gives you the boost along Stokes V. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that gets, the only reason that's constrained is because we included these flux cal observations which have hydra and system noise, which are assumed to be zero circular polarization. Does it make sense to separately and then later merge into the The nice thing about pulling all of these things out is um, everything can be kind of understood is in, in terms of those fundamental changes. So, for example, the differential phase, the, the middle plot, and the sigmas in the uppermost plot are just rotations of your basis that don't change. They don't have any impact on the orthogonality of the receptors. And the differences, like the differential gain in the second from the bottom, and the delta theta and delta chi are the boosts that distort your total intensity. So I think that's the power in this parameterization. You can think, is this just changing my basis or is this actually distorting my, my total intensity profile? And if all you wanted to do is pulsar timing, you might not care about the absolute correctness of the polarization. You wouldn't care about the basis transformations, the, the differential phase or the sigmas as long as they didn't depolarize your signal. So the differential phase is going to depolarize your signal if you integrate in frequency, but that sigma chi is pretty constant as a function of frequency, so it's not going to lead to depolarization of your signal if you, if you integrate. That's, so that's one one run. Uh, there are other things put out in the PCM. So this is just these are just the model parameters that describe the Jones matrix. It can also determine the uh, Stokes parameters of the cow. So one of the um, things we can also plot are those those Stokes parameters. And basically, what we see here is so C1, C2, C3 are like Stokes uh, Q, U, and V of the cow. And here we see that it's close to 100% cal, but it actually goes a little bit above. It goes to 101% in this part of the band. And that's just responding to the bit of overpolarization that we saw in the raw data. Uh, oh, hang on a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, was, I was almost going to be confused by the top plot. Why is there? So the, the top plot is just the magnitude of that polarization vector. So you can see uh, where you can see the overpolarization, but actually it doesn't change much from U because. V and Q are so small to it, small compared. Nice to, um, 
That's right. Yeah, everything is on a scale where Stokes I is one or 100%. Yeah. Uh, another diagnostic you can look at if you can't remember what all those values of the reduced chi squared were. So you can say, what, what is the goodness of fit as a function of frequency? And those get stored as well. So you can see all those 1.3s, 1.3 somethings, uh, just to evaluate the, the quality uh, of the observation or of the, of the, of the fit. <clears throat> um, let's, uh, yeah. All right. I think if you, if you look at the notes, so I, I've made these notes that I'm running through. They're just a Google Doc in that folder. And I was going to show what happens if you make different assumptions. Like this, this one is the one that we just ran was while I'm pointing on Hydra, the system temperature and sky temperature and Hydra all together have close to zero circular polarization. Um, you can add the command line option minus y to instead take the difference between on and off observations. And that will change the, um, your estimate of the delta chi, because it's going to change your estimate of the boost of Stokes V. Um, and you, you, can, you can then plot that difference if you like. You can also constrain that boost along the Stokes V axis by assuming that your noise diode has zero circular polarization. And all three of those will result in fairly similar answers. And in, in, well, at least the first and last two are, imp it's impossible to distinguish them by the goodness of fit. Um, but they would all end up with different estimates of that boost along the Stokes V axis. I'm going to ask you to take my word for it for now, and I'll, instead I'll show you how to run uh, METM, the measurement. Um, sorry, just just a question. So I mean, um, so so now, like with 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 MEM, now you end up with this PCM dot fit. So, yeah. all right, and uh, um, I mean, isn't so this is the, 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 the calibration solution. So again, uh, like we can simply add the PCM.fit to pack and calibrate other. Um, yeah, that's a really important point actually. Uh, and I'm, I don't have any other Pulsar data prepared to show that right now. And I, I don't think I would have any on my laptop, unfortunately, but yeah, you, so this PCM.fits file, you can add it to the database, but when you run pack minus W, you can tell it to look out for these files as well. And then when you run pack, um, so it's pack, pack minus uppercase S, I think, yeah, to use the complete reception model. So when you say pack minus S, uppercase S, it'll look in the database file for these PCM.fits style solutions. And it'll use that model of the Jones matrix to calibrate your pulsar. Um, is PCM that fits uh, dependent on the hour angle? Uh, no. Uh, so it it would be the the Mueller matrix that sits behind the parallactic angle rotation. So okay. Okay. So 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 basically, what we so the PCM dot fits now is a solution for that bandwidth but valid for every kind of elevation every kind of, of our angle every kind of position in the sky yes uh, and okay only, only for a, a dish that you can point at the source and keep it on axis so it doesn't it doesn't model any off axis like if for for low far for example um, there, would, there would need to be a position dependent jones matrix yeah Okay, perfect. Thanks. I, I can actually, there's probably enough time here to show. So we could run uh, NEM again with the minus Y option just to show uh, what happens. So I'll just run PCM. Uh, if I add this minus Y option, and let that run in the background. Uh, and then I'll also get set up in another window 
to show you an EPM. So here we're going to run an ETM. I'm just going to use the uh, the total.ar that we've just produced using MEM as the standard and treat that like a polarized reference source. And then I'm going to template match a single five minute integration of 0437 to that standard to um, uh, just demonstrate how we don't need to have variation in parallactic angle, um, but we do need some other things. So first, first I'll just run that command. Uh, so if we say, we can choose as our standard the thing that we just created in the MEM directory, that total.ar. Minus H just tells PCM to choose the number of harmonics to use. So this, this template matching is done in the frequency domain, or this, let's say, spin frequency domain. So we take a Fourier transform of the pulse profile and do the template matching there. Um, so I'm just going to match to say one of the pulsar observations. I just choose a random one. I did have one. Let me do this carefully because I did have one that shows the problem that we're going to try to solve. Okay. Uh, so this is just taking this one observation and doing the template matching. You see, it runs very quickly. Uh, it's getting reduced chi squares in the vicinity of unity, which is nice. maybe running a bit slower. So it's, it's produced a solution. If we look at that solution now, it's also produced a total.ar, but it's just the calibrated uh, version of that one file that I chose as input. So if we now try to plot the solution, the main thing you'll see here is some instability. So it, it had a lock on the ellipticities, and then it lost that lock on the ellipticities. It jumped up to some weird, like, basically made the receptors circularly polarized. And you can see it at the same time, there seems to be some uncertainty or instability in the differential phase. Uh, so this is basically just demonstrating the need to be in the vicinity of the solution before you just jump in and start um, telling the least squares estimator to um, follow the gradient. So the way to get METM into the vicinity of the solution is just to point it at the uh, calibrator database. And it'll choose the nearest cal and say, I'm going to use the differential gain and differential phase as derived from this ideal feed assumption to put me in the location of the actual minimum. The chi-squared, the reduced chi-squared has increased significantly, and I'm not sure why. I need to think about that. Uh, now we can plot the same solution, and it should look a lot more stable. Here, I'm, it's using the default uh, model of the of the Jones uh, Jones matrix, which in turn, instead of being parameterized in terms of the sums and differences of the ellipticities, it's just the ellipticities themselves. So. Here you can see the white, white and red curves plotting the ellipticities of the receptors. And the, in the upper panel, the white and red curves plotting their orientations. <coughs> yeah, there's a, yeah. This would seem to indicate that there's significant non-orthogonality in, in the yeah it seems greater than I would have expected so I'm going to try just to see does this it looks a bit like a problem does that problem go away for example if I use the Britain uh, parameterization so we're still getting reduced chi-squares that aren't great um, And we're still seeing 
some non-orthogonality. So here the red line is the differences in theta. Um, oh, sorry, the, the white, let me be sure about this. I think the white line down here must be the difference in theta, the delta theta, and the, the sum is up here. These aren't the curves that I was expecting doing an METM fit, to be honest. Uh, that's the machinery, that's how you would do it. I'm gonna think a little bit more about, maybe if we add more data, also look at was there something strange in the um, calibrator the Stokes parameters yeah yeah we can do that um, is the 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 reference the standard uh, reference the one that is I mean supposedly is the is the is the template uh, scrunched in time yeah it does get scrunched in time uh, but not okay so it does allow the profile to vary with frequency and the state uh, and the state of the of the um, um, archives should be coherence stocks or is un, or is not uh, important it, yeah that won't that won't matter I think PCM will convert the state automatically as needed yeah. all right perfect thanks those would be good things to check, <laughs> given this strange result. So I'll, I'll plot them side by side so we can uh, compare. We have the one here derived using an ETM, and the one that we derived uh, using MEM, plotted using the same command line. Size them so that they're similar. Maybe get to fit better. Yeah. The, the one on the left is the MEM, so the MEM derived solution by tracking over. Multiple parallactic angles. That's right. So it had to make this assumption that the yeah the, the one is zero, but changing to just match one of those observations against the template gives us quite a different solution. And I don't think I had so the red line seems to be consistent, but the white line has jumped um, so to negative five. So that that white line is the delta theta. Um, um, but can it be? No, wait, that cannot be. Because now we are considering the total dot r as the let's say intrinsic polarization profile. And we have basically forgotten about. I mean, no, okay, maybe maybe see about that. I mean, can it can it be simply that the two observations uh, or the so the series of observations and the other one that now you just calibrated with the METM were very were very distant in time. Uh, so that total dot AR was derived from uh, a directory that contained <coughs> contained that data file. Mm -hmm. In a way, you could say total dot AR should be the integrated sum of data that span and include that that data file. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> No. That's why this, this result is a bit unexpected to me. <laughs> I am uh, scratching my head a bit, wondering, because it seems to indicate great non orthogonality. What we could do, just for experiment's sake, is look, say, what if we tried fitting a different file and then seeing, uh, I'll go back to the METM. So we're here doing the METM. So I chose that one file as a demonstration of how things can go wrong. What we could also do is, uh, so where do we, 
Yeah. In fact, we, we could try a big fit of all the data. That's not a bad idea. Maybe I'll, I'll do one hour, because I think it can take quite a, quite a long time. <laughs> so we do our. Start up. That would just be that. Two eighteen. So let's see. So, oh no, that was yeah, two one. So that should take everything in the that one hour, which seems about right. It took maybe twelve five minute integrations there. So this chi squared still isn't good. It's making me wonder if they've done something on my laptop. Uh, modified the code or did some experimentation. I got real drunk, so I guess I could do it. <laughs> well, one thing I didn't do actually is put that minus s on. You could see if that. Um, that still has some of my debugging comments. So I have been um, fishing around in this code that computes, uh, normalizes by the total invariant, which it's calling the total determinant here. I'm going to redirect that to dev null for now. And we'll look at it when it's done. One of the dangers of doing live demonstrations. I could also get rid of that um, buggy message. While I'm doing that, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, that's unexpected. I'm hoping, I have a little bit of hope that maybe it's this normalization to minus, by the invariant to minus s will fix things up. Um, not sure how many threads I should use to make. <laughs> yeah. So my thinking is that by getting rid of this uh, error message, things will run more quickly. So I'll use the freshly built PCM. Okay, so that's getting rid of all the, it does take a, quite a bit longer to load uh, the data in this mode. Minus s on one yeah, yeah. All right, so with the minus s, I'm getting much better reduced chi yes, squares yeah, right, right. again. One one. Yeah, but you still had the, the, the non orthogonality. Yeah, huh. did you say you're getting a difference at the top? Uh, in the top one, the sigmas. Yeah. Yeah. Which parameterization is that? Just okay. So that's oh, but that's looking a lot better. That, uh, what's the what is the very top panel? The top panel is the sums. Uh, so now you've got the red line close to zero, and the white line is the sum of the elasticity, which is which is good. Okay, so. <laughs> Fingers crossed this problem will go away with the minus s. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. What I didn't expect was for these, like if this really, if the minus s option really does make this go away, I didn't expect the scintillation to cause to drive this non-orthogonality parameter. But let's see, fingers crossed. Uh, Should the profiles be RM corrected? Hmm. So the non-orthogonality has gone away. Okay, so this is looking better. The, the white curve here is the one that had dropped to minus five. Uh, did I get rid of that? Yeah, so it had dropped to minus five without the minus s option. That left me a bit baffled. So what's the difference of the position? Yeah, so um, the if you remember, so in the Van Stratten parameterization, maybe it's still in the other directory. I should let me check if it's still there. Um, So it, it did start out, so that, that some, some of the ellipticities, um, the receptors have equal ellipticities. Uh, and here one is set to zero. Ah, so the, the orientation is set to zero in this one. So we don't get a sum of the orientations, but we do get a sum of the ellipticities, which is the sigma chi. So that's sum, but there it's plotted seven. Yeah, but it's also it's the same sum plotted here uh, with a mean value of ten. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because the re receptor ellipticities are around five. Yeah. Um, I think I've now lost. Yeah, I did <laughs> the other the other plot that showed the main concern was that this white line here, which looks squiggly but with a mean near zero, had dropped to minus five and was showing non-orthogonality. And all of that again was just the normalization by, by minus s okay. <laughs> that fixed it. Uh, so my bad for the bit of a red herring there. Um, Willem, is it necessary to have the um, uh, archives uh, uh, RM corrected? Like yeah. for example, the, 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 the template. It, yeah, good question. And the short answer is we haven't been doing it here. And I think because we're at a fairly high frequency, like 1400 megahertz, and well, I guess just that alone lets us get away without worrying about it. But it is actually visible. And it comes up in this red line here. So the main reason this red line might not be zero it might, might be due to the differential Faraday rotation between what's integrated in the standard and what's in uh, the, the window of observations that were chosen to make this, this file. Um, so this is about an hour that went into this solution that's plotted now. And over that hour, the RM might have been a bit different. And that'll show up as a rotation about the line of sight by something like minus minus 2.5 degrees, it looks like. Another point that I'm a bit uh, puzzled about, I mean, especially for uh, METM, that is, yeah, I mean, I, it, with, with the METM, you're basically washing away any kind of variability that there might be in your data intrinsic variability. Like if you are searching for, for example, for polarization, for, for variations of the uh, percentage of linear polarization or, or, or circular polarization and uh, you have a data set of I don't know one year and you have one observation every month yeah. um, then in that case if you do if you perform a, a, a METM a, you are effectively washing away this thing I don't know what I, I cannot make up my mind with respect to the RM uh, but for sure, the polarization levers or the polarization profiles are gone. The variability. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess the um, if there if there was pulsar intrinsic polarization variability, um, you'd expect it to be have some phase dependence. It wouldn't happen 
globally over all phases using the same Jones matrix. So you'd say you'd, you'd need a pulse phase dependent Jones matrix to describe that variability. And, it, and if there was that kind of variability, um, it, uh, it wouldn't be modeled well by PCM, which is applying a single Jones matrix to all of the phase bins. So I, I would argue that if, if there was pulsar intrinsic variability, you wouldn't get a good reduced chi-squared, for example, in, when you run these PCM fits. So the one that we just ran now in the template matching, you can see the, again, we got reduced chi-squareds of, of the order one. Mm -hmm. so if, if, if somehow, let's say your pulsar developed a new component that was uh, linearly polarized, that should result in increasing the reduced chi-squared. And that, that might be one indicator of a poor fit. Mm. Um, I guess, uh, but you're right. The, the pulse shape variations that are intrinsic to the pulsar, if they're small enough to just re increase the reduced chi-squared by like 0.1 or something, so you don't really notice maybe straight away, or even care straight away, but the, the, that that shape change, even though there's a small reduction or a small increase in the reduced chi squared, is able to bias one of your model parameters in a certain direction. Uh, then, then yeah, you you'd have to say that this calibration technique, based on using a, a pulsar as a polarized reference source, will fail, okay. or at least, at least not perform as well as you'd hoped. That's one of the reasons why, uh, so in the 2013 paper where I um, developed this technique, um, I derived all these solutions using 0437, but then applied them to 1022 plus 1001. So 1022 is one of these pulsars that's notorious for having uh, shape, shape variability and there's debate on whether it's instrumental or happening in the interstellar medium or intrinsic to the the pulsar and what what that paper shows is that taking these Jones matrices or mo models of the instrumental response derived from 0437 and applying them to another pulsar improves the timing precision of that pulsar quite quite significantly and so that kind of lends credence to the let's say the, the point of view that it is okay to make this assumption at least at least over say seven year time scale um, but yeah, it's, some, it's something I, I wouldn't take it as for granted for the rest of um, the IPTA's life, for example, <laughs> that the MSPs that we're observing can be used as polarized reference sources. In fact, there's evidence that you can't already. I mean, some, some of those sources that are observed in the, in the PPTA, for example, do have shown uh, variations in their average pulse profiles. One thing I did in the background is I ran MEM a second way. Um, so I'll just show, uh, I'll make a directory to compare them. And in the compare directory, I'll do the same uh, template so I'm going to run METM where I treat the total from MEM as the template and I match it to the total produced using MEM minus Y and see what comes out. Uh, those are incredibly low reduced chi-squares, but I guess we're, we're matching data that were derived from the, the exact same data set. So these two data sets are highly correlated or those two totals are, are highly correlated. But what, what we're interested in picturing here is the, what, what's the difference or what, what is the Jones matrix that maps one to the other? And you see it's mostly uh, like the identity matrix, the scale is one, the differential gain is zero, the differential phase is zero. And there seems to be some wobble in the ellipticities. Now, if I choo choose a better parameterization, say let's model this. 
uh, minus y says instead of just pointing at the flux calibrator and calling that my zero zero polarization state, I'm going to subtract off source from on source and use the difference as my unpolarized state. Uh, and if I use the Britain parameterization. So this points back to that. Yeah, that's right. And do this a little more quickly on four threads. And then plot the result. Um, you can see more clearly here we have delta theta in white, which is zero, but the delta chi's, which give us the boost along Stokes V, have changed. So those two assumptions do, two different assumptions do produce different values of this boost parameter. But you can see in these data, it's small. And this is the reason why I got away with it. Uh, whereas it wasn't possible to get away with this assumption at GBT. Uh, that's just a small, a small demo of, uh, I, guess, I guess, how the assumptions that you make um, will, will change the, the Jones matrix that comes out in the end. But that's, that's pretty much everything I was going to show as part of the practicum. Uh, there's not a lot of time to talk about uh, dishes. Do, do you guys, well, does every, does everyone who's online have time, say, for another 10 or 15 minutes to look at and think about uh, tight arrays? Yes. All the night. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> No, <laughs> it's false, but yes. Let me get this out of the way. Is everyone here okay with another 10 or 15 minutes? Um, so those notes were just at the end of this presentation. Um, so talking about phased arrays. I close you. Uh, so, the, the response of a phased array is a sum of electric fields um, that have been observed at different dishes. So, the way that we're representing that here, I, the subscript I is just the ith uh, dish. And the, again, these slides are limiting to thinking just along the Bohr side of a dish that can be steered. And we'll talk in a little bit about how to change that when you have a dipole array and you can't you can't steer it to point your antenna along a boresight direction to your source. So we have the J, -th, sorry, the I -th Jones matrix appearing as an uppercase J, and the electric field that is impinging on the I -th, uh, antenna with an E subscript I. That's the astronomical source and how, it, how it's being uh, received at the ith antenna. And then there's noise. That'll be just like the thermal noise or whatever from the ith antenna. So in a, in a phased array, we're applying some complex gain to the signal from the ith antenna. So that's this phi sub i. Unfortunately, I'm also using the symbol i to represent the square root of negative 1 here. I maybe should have used the j for one or the other. Uh, so that phi with a straight stroke through it is the, you could say the, the, gain, the complex phase applied in the beamformer. And the output is E prime, the sum of all these um, electric fields. The, for a point source where you have like 100% spatial coherence, the signal that arrives at the ith dish, we're looking at the second row now, is just the signal from the source prop, uh, multiplied by some geometric delay. So I'm using a curly phi or var phi here to represent the geometric delay. And if our, um, so the two terms that appear in the exponential here are just scalars. I don't have to worry about how do they commute with other matrices. I can just move them around in the equations as I wish. And I'm making the assumption that, um, so that's the phase applied to the ith element. That's the geometric delay of the ith element. And if 
my array is properly phased, the, the geometric delay is equal and opposite to the instrumental delay that's being applied in the, in the beamformer, then those two terms cancel out. And I'm left with just a sum of Jones matrices multiplied by the electric field of the, um, the astrono astronomical source. And there, there is a sum of ni terms, but I'm just dropping them. They're just the noise floor that we're not concerned with here. So I, I can group that, that you know, matrix multiplication is associative, I think is the property that we're using here. So I can group that sum of Jones matrices and now think of my phased array as having a single Jones matrix represented by J, where J is on the bottom line, just the sum of all the Jones matrices from all of the individual elements in the array. So this is maybe just getting us all on the same page in terms of notation. The next thing to consider for phased array is what, what happens when we have phase errors? So if we have an incorrect absolute phase term, there's gonna be the, the sum that I create is gonna have some residual delta bar phi sub i for each dish. And the Jones matrix J prime here is going to differ from the Jones matrix that was uh, presented on the previous slide. So that's one type of problem. And maybe there's an error in how the geometric delay is computed or an error in the position of the element and how, it, how it's computed or, or how it's recorded. Um, but we can also have a diff an incorrect differential phase. And this is probably much more likely because X and Y are typically phased up separately. We point at what's ostensibly an unpolarized source and treat it as an unpolarized point source. But if there is some degree of polarization and there's some cross correlation between X and Y signals, or uh, if there's structure that's polarized and you bias the phase in X one way and the phase in Y the other way, you can get this differential phase term. And this is also gonna change the resulting Jones matrix. So those, those two errors uh, will um, create an error in the polarimetry. And what I'm interested in understanding, and I haven't put any thought beyond this, this little presentation here is um, how much more sensitive is the polarization of the, or let's say the polarimetric response of your instrument to these phase errors than something like the sensitivity of your, so in principle, if there are, if there are errors in phasing up in the array, the array will lose coherence and you won't get the signal to noise ratio that you expect. So you'd see less flux from your source than you'd expect from a perfectly phased array. So like how, uh, how much coherence loss is acceptable if all you care about is the total intensity versus how much coherence loss is acceptable if you're trying to do accurate polarization? Or what, let's say, what is the RMS in delta bar phi and delta phi that can be accepted in both of those cases? And I don't know if anybody's um, done any theoretical work on that front, if there's a paper that discusses this or a memo, a technical memo from another observatory. But that might be an interesting problem to, to think about. Um, now I don't know if I have any more slides. That was it for, for slides. So that's just, um, let's say a starting point. Now when, when you uh, consider this sum for, uh, fixed dipoles where you're electronically steaming, sorry, electronically steering your beam uh, to point at a, or phase up to a point on the sky, that Jones matrix Ji there must become a function of azimuth and zenith uh, owing to things like beam squint and beam squash and um, you know, your different dipoles are going to be projected onto the sky differently at different angles. So maybe the first order effect is a differential gain term that arises as a function of azimuth and zenith. And I'm describing this mostly in the reference frame of the, the antennas, uh, because you'd expect that at least uh, maybe in the long, or maybe on, on some time scale, that response should be stable. And then the challenge there is how do you determine uh, this response? You need to have an array of sources that appear at different azimuth and zenith angles. 
So the nice thing is, at least for, um, you know, if you, if you have the time to track sources, you can track, track a lot of sources from rise to set. So if you have a source at one declination, you can probe a certain part of your azimuth and zenith parameter space, but you'll want a variety of sources at different declinations to pass through an overhead uh, over, the, over the zenith angle or overhead of your telescope, both in the north and both in the south with respect to your telescope in order to fully characterize this Jones matrix that varies as a function of azimuth and zenith. Uh, so th then the question is, well, how many sources are required? In one source tracking over multiple hour angles will give you a good track, but how many of those tracks do you need to fully characterize the beam? And I guess that'll just depend on over what angular scale does your beam vary. And mo most of the curves that I've seen coming from very small beams on single dishes where they've done this mapping, you know, the patterns look fairly smooth. There's not a lot of high frequency structure, but that, that's something you would have to, I think, determine experimentally. And probably you'd get a good idea about the variation in angular structure just from the track on a single source, because you'd be probing at, at least one, uh, one slice through this beam pattern on the sky. And from maybe from that source, you can identify what are the smallest angular scales that need to be probed by an array of sources passing overhead? And then that tells you the kind of separation and declination that you need to fully probe or, or fully characterize uh, this beam. Um, what should be um, the, the, the what should be the parameters to be compared? Because you were saying we we can try to understand how the beam. Uh, how fast, let's say, the beam is varying in azimuth and elevation and zenith. Um, so, I mean, uh, can, can we can we take as an example, yeah, the polarization profiles, for example, or uh, or should we search for this for the for the parameters of the Mueller matrix? The the Mueller matrix or the Jones matrix that you use to describe. Um, the response of the instrument at that point would probably be the most sensitive. For, for example, you can concentrate all of a pulse profile. Like if you have a, if you're using a, polar, uh, a pulsar as your polarized reference source, at that point in time, you can do it like an METM fit to a template and um, concentrate all of that signal from all those phase bins into those seven numbers of the Jones matrix. That, that, that makes me think you'd be most sensitive to it there. And you, okay. might, and you might find that it's really one parameter that varies, like the, the differential gain would, would certainly vary, um, but, but maybe you'll also find uh, other, other properties varying. And I think that would be the most interesting thing. So you, you're doing it an METM fit and plotting these model parameters as a function of our angle. But if you wanted to get really fancy, maybe you could project that line or somehow decompose it or use it to light up the components in a spherical harmonic decomposition of the beam over the whole sky, right? And from, you, you know, if you do this, if you project it onto some spherical harmonic basis, maybe that would show you the largest uh, harmonic number that you need to consider beyond which it's just kind of flat white noise. Uh, Maybe that's getting a bit too fancy. Maybe, maybe all you need is something like a Fourier transform uh, in time to say, or if you, can, if you can convert your time axis to an angular, like an hour angle axis or something like that. I guess those are... Those are really but the, um, I mean, to get, uh, to get the template, uh, no, the, 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 the um, trustable template, um, you would need to, like, there are, there are, for example, at the frequencies where we are operating, there is basically nothing that is that has been studied properly in polarization. So we don't have any um, we don't have any profile that we can trust. Uh, so so for this, we need to apply in any case MEM. Also, uh, um, also. That's that's interesting because now instead of your nice little simple rotation between your Mueller matrix and your source, your unknown Mueller matrix and your unknown source, 
uh, you, you, you beef that up with other things like the projection effects, so the differential oh. of the receptors. Um, and, and maybe you'd have to accept other things varying in a way that isn't well modeled, but you just say, let's assume it's going to vary smoothly. So we'll allow a differential ellipticity or a, a, another mm -hmm. rotation to appear in this equation where we don't know its functional form, but we'll allow it to vary as a polynomial over this observation. And um, yeah, try to try to improve the fit that way. Yeah, that's it's not impossible. Um, so at PCM at the moment allows gain, differential gain, and differential phase to vary as polynomial functions of time. And we can take that same functionality and apply it to other elements of the Jones matrix to, to um, achieve that. Achieve yeah. that. But I mean, if we if we correct, uh, if we have a, a correction for like the projections, projections effect, and so on. I mean, in in uh, in, uh, in theory, a classic MEM would be still possible. I mean, the one that you perform, for example. That's right. If we if we could predict the transformation, that, that should map uh, the the Jones matrix of the instrument to the sky, uh, where. Where now it's just a parallactic angle rotation, but you could plug in any any transformation there that you know. Let's say you have a theoretical model that predicts what the transformation should be. So you, you could put anything that you know in there, but you could also add things that you might not know by allowing them to vary as a function of time smoothly 